our mind, uh, to our body, to our souls, to our spirits. So the third, the third thing, and again, I want you to put on your thinking caps here as we look at this. The third thing we want to look at now tonight is the intricate design of God's first word. What you'll find is there's an intricate design of, of the word of God as you go through the entire Bible. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, 18, he said, Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not, um, he says, one jot uh, or one tittle, right? A jot, lenny, and a tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And he is saying every little dot, every little, right here, here's a jot and a tittle, a crossing of a T and the dotting of an I. That every little dash, there is significance in it. And the rabbis for, for years uh, taught that. And I believe that. It's something that I've, I've taught here through, uh, through the years. So when we take, when we take the, um, the first verse in the Bible, and um, you'll notice here, these are the Hebrew letters. I'll read them. Elohim created in the beginning earth and the heavens, the. And uh, you'll notice there are, there are numbers up above it, and um, those numbers there in Hebrew, and in fact, by the way, in English and in Greek and in Latin, there is a numerical value for each uh, letter. So, for instance, in the, in the English uh, alphabet, letter A would be um, the number one, letter B would be the number two, and so forth as you go through. There's a numerical value for each letter in Hebrew. Uh, something that I, I have taught uh, here, the, the Bible has what is called a hepatic structure. Heptatic is, is, is a word for the number seven. And uh, when you read the Bible, you see that seven permeates the totality of, of Scripture uh, over and over again. And seven, what, seven speaks of what when we are concerned God? The perfection of God. Yeah, seven is the perfect number. It's the number uh, that speaks of the perfection of God. So there are 287 usages of the number seven. Okay, the number seven is used 287 times in the Old Testament. If you take 287 and you divide it by seven... Okay, it equals 41. It's a divisible number by 7. And um, the word 7th occurs 98 times uh, in, the, uh, in the Tanakh, in the, in the Old Testament. And the word 7-fold appears 7 times. Each one of those times, again, uh, divisible by 7. When you take the first verse, okay, of, of the Bible, Genesis, let me, let me show you this. Um, in fact, let me, let, me, let, me just, um, let me throw some of these things out at you before I do that. The... Um, and throughout the scriptures, and when we go through the book of Genesis, here is the number seven repeated over and over again. God saw seven times the goodness of creation. Okay, chapter two and three, the creation week. Okay, seven days. Uh, four fifteen, sevenfold vengeance on Cain's killer. Uh, verse twenty four of chapter four, uh, seventy sevenfold vengeance on Lamech's uh, killer. Genesis five, incidental references to the ages. Uh, Genesis 7, the seven clean animals. Genesis 7, 4, the flesh starts in seven days. Genesis 7, 10 through 12, seven days fulfilled, shows the Lord kept his word. 8, 4, the ark rested in the seventh month. Uh, chapter 8, verse 10 and 12, seven days between sending of the doves. Chapter 9, 13 through 16, the seven colors of the rainbow. Chapter 11 uh, and through chapter 12, incidental references to ages. 21, 28 through 30, seven uh, ewe lambs. 29, 18 through 30, seven uh, years for Rachel, then seven more years uh, for, um, what's her name, Leah? Chapter 31, 23, incidental usage of seven, uh, 33, three, Jacob bowed down seven times, 41, seven years of plenty and seven years of famine under Joseph, Genesis uh, 46, uh, incidental, again, references of the number seven. If you go through the scripture, can you think of other times where seven is used? How many uh, candlesticks are there in the candelabra that God instructed Moses to make in Exodus chapter uh, right, 26? And then again, through the book of Leviticus, there are seven. How many feasts are there? How many feasts of the, uh, of the Lord in the book of Leviticus, right? You have seven, the Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, uh, day of atonement, and tabernacle. Uh, Daniel, you come to the book of Daniel, and we have Daniel 77, one of the most amazing prophecies, predicts to the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey from the, uh, the time of the um, edict made by, ne um, I'm sorry, made by um, Artaxerxes in the book of Nehemiah chapter 2. It was exactly 70 times 7, 490 Hebrew years to the day Jesus enters into Jerusalem. And that prophecy is, is in uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. Uh, and uh, John, how many times did Jesus say, I am? Right, you have the, the, the seven I am statements uh, of Jesus in John chapter 6 through John chapter 15. 
And Revelation is just packed with, with sevens. And I, I won't go through them all, but the seven spirits, the seven seals of the, you know, of the book, the seven golden lampstands, you know, so you know, on and so forth. So when we when we come when we come to Genesis one, um, let me uh, let me have you just you know you take a look at that. There are seven words, okay? Uh, Harizits, uh, Vet, uh, Shemian, It, Elohim, Bara, and Barashi. The earth and the heaven God created in the beginning. Seven seven uh, words. Now I'm going to use a, um, a a listing here that was done by Ivan Panin before computers were invented. If you want to read a book, pick up a book where Ivan Panin went through and he noticed these this, these sevens appearing over and over and over again. And uh, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, this is a partial listing of the phenomenal features of sevens found in Genesis. I, I had to give a partial listing because I would have had to use ten slides to give you all the rest. Just understand that. The number of Hebrew words is seven. The number of letters equals 28, right, divisible by seven. The first three Hebrew words translated in the beginning, uh, God created, have uh, 14 letters, again, divisible by seven. The last four Hebrew words, the heavens and the earth, are divisible, again, uh, the number 14 divisible by seven. The fourth and fifth words have seven letters. The sixth and seventh words have seven letters. The three key words, God, heaven, and earth, have 14 letters, again, divisible by seven. The number of letters in the four remaining words is also 14, divisible by seven. The shortest word in the verse is the middle word uh, with seven letters. 10th and 11th, the Hebrew numerical value of the first, middle, and last letters is 133 divisible by 7, and the Hebrew numerical value of the first and last letters of all seven words equals uh, uh, 1,393, which is divisible by 7. Again, I'll just show you here real quickly the, um, the way um, the Hebrew, okay, uh, attributes to the first letter of the Hebrew. The Hebrew is read backwards, so you have to look into the right column at the top. But you'll see the uh, first letter, LF, and you have the number one. And as you progress through, that is how the, uh, the value goes. Now, when Ivan Panin did this, he presented it. Let me read this quote to you, and I quote, when professor, professors on the, on the mathematics faculty at Harvard University were presented with this biblical phenomenon, they naturally attempted to disprove its significance as a proof of divine authorship. However, after valiant efforts, these professors were unable to duplicate this incredible mathematical phenomenon. The Harvard scientists used the English language and artificially assigned numerical values to the English alphabet. And they had a potential vocabulary of, uh, of over 400,000 available English words to choose from to construct a sentence about any topic they chose. And you compare this to the limitations of, of word choices in the biblical Hebrew language, which has only 4,500 uh, available word choices uh, that the writers of the Old Testament could use. Despite their advanced mathematical abilities and access to computers, the mathematicians were unable to come close to incorporating 30 mathematical multiples of seven as found in the Hebrew words of Genesis 1.1. When it was uh, brought to um, Statistic Magazine, they also were not able to do it with computers. And they basically declared it to be a phenomenon. I just want to see something. What is, what is the most amazing code in the natural realm? The most amazing code in the natural realm. DNA. What is it? Um, DNA. Say it loud. DNA? Yeah, yeah. Very plenty. Um, the DNA code. You know, the DNA code is, is, this, is this incredible map. The, 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 the founders of DNA and, and many of the, um, now the scientists, but they've come out and said, there's no way this could happen by chance. You know, evolution says, you know, given enough time and chance, anything can happen. The, 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 the mathematical probability of, uh, of the code that basically, you know, has you as you are, and, and believe it or not, they can take a, a tiny cell from your eyelash, and they could, um, you know, and as, as time progresses, and hopefully they won't do this, they can clone an exact you. And uh, there's this, this incredible mathematical code um, that you see. Just to understand this, that same God who created the DNA code uh, gave us his word. And what you find is, as you look deeply into the word, you find that it's that same, that same amazing mathematical improbability. Okay, and I say mathematical improbability because there's no way what I just showed you, and this is just one verse. We're not talking about all the other verses, right? There's, there's, there's 32,000 more of them, okay, mm -hmm. in the scriptures. And uh, when you begin to see that there are there is this this incredible code, and um, well, again all these sevens and all these things that are interwoven throughout the scriptures. There's a um, uh, Chris, you did you did Joey and Sarah's wedding uh, this past uh, Saturday, and um, 
Joey and Sarah, Sarah came here and she was somewhat of a skeptic. And then she and time, and Chris and, and Alicia, they, 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 led, they led her to the Lord. And what had happened was, and she said to me, one thing that, that was very convincing for her was when I was going through Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse 1 through 18, the heptatic structure in the genealogy of Jesus. And showing that, that that heptatic structure goes on and on and on. All these sevens, the, all these sevens interwoven. And again, the scientist is not able to explain it and saying this is just some type of an anomaly or a phenomena that we cannot explain. Understand this. If, if you took, took 40,000 rabbis and they sat down for 400,000 years, they couldn't do it. They can't do it with computers today. Watson can't do it. You know, Watson is the, the IBM, the great IBM. They can't do it, okay? That's the greatest computer on earth. So just, it, it's a phenomenon. That's good. God's mind is much greater than our minds. God's mind is much greater than anything we can create. Sarah was convicted by that, and she began to say, this has to be a book, a supernatural book. And as she began to read it, God opened her heart, and she gave her life to Jesus. So that is the power of, of, of coming to understand um, some of these things. Now, you know, bring you back to Genesis 1.1, and uh, let's look at this, a couple of uh, other neat phenomena that occurs here. So Genesis 1.1, the earth and the heavens, and um, elephant, elephant tab, um, what you have here is that, that word in the middle, it's kind of an untranslated word. They, they, they say that it's the definite article, but uh, it, it's kind of an untranslated Hebrew word. So it says the earth and the heavens, the God, if you want to use the word the, created in the beginning. Now the, the Hebrew alphabet not only has a numerical value, they have a, a, a figure a figurative va value. And um, so if you look, the again, the first letter of the Hebrew alph the alphabet, you have the ox and strength. It always stands for a leader, uh, a leader. Look at the last the last letter down your right-hand column, Tav. Notice what that is. It's the sign of the covenant of, of the cross. And um, when, you, uh, when you take uh, and, you, and you break down uh, these, these pictures, the pictures here, um, Bet, um, being house, resh, the first person, man's head, aleph, uh, God, again, the head, the leader, the ox, shin, consume, destroy, um, sign of a, a teeth, of, of basically destroying something, yod, handy, uh, hand works, or it's a picture of an arm, and uh, an arm and a hand, and tav, covenant, mark, cross, and um, when, you, when you take that, uh, it's in the beginning, uh, it's a picture of the son of God, uh, being consumed and destroyed on the cross. In fact, I'll just show you something here. If you take and you look at the right-hand column, uh, God, the Son, destroyed on the cross, a picture of the hand, could be a reference to his uh, piercing. Uh, and, you know, I've been asked, when, when is the first time that we see the revelation of the Son of God in Scripture? And usually people refer to Genesis 3.15, right? The, 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 the prophecy that the, from essentially from the seed of the woman, right? A woman doesn't have a seed. A man has a seed. But from the seed of the woman would come one who would crush the serpent's head. And that is a, a, a prophecy that is, is held, even by the, the, by the rabbis, that it's from the Messiah. It's a prophecy of Messiah. I believe that in Genesis 1-1, you have the first revelation of Jesus. It gets, it, it, it gets, it gets, it gets deeper, uh, deeper as we, you know, as we go through this. Now, uh, the Hebrew alphabet, and let's take it a step further here. The, um, now this is the Hebrew alphabet as it's it meant to be read. We, again, we read from right to left. So what is the first letter uh, of, the, of, the he, of the Hebrew alphabet right there? Right? I'm sorry, from right to left. It's a left. You see the word up top? So we're, we're, starting, we're starting up top and working down. So you have a left is the first letter, and tal is the last letter. So you remember that, that, that uninterpreted word that I, I was just showing you? Yeah, look at that, aleph and tav. What do we call it, and what, what do we say in, um, you know, in, in the Greek? It's the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. The first and the last. I'll show you a couple of, of passages where this, where this appears. This, this strange word that is, is frequently, on, it goes untranslated. And even the, the, the rabbis have a hard time translating it. And your Christian and Hebrew scholars hard time translating. Zechariah 12.10. And um, in Zechariah 12.10, it's a prophecy of Jesus. It says, on me, and uh, they will look, um, they pierced whom? And um, you have the word appear there, the Aleph and the Teth. 
And if you, if you look at the Aleph and the Tav there, the Alpha and the Omega, okay, the beginning and the end, on me. And they will look uh, whom they pierced. Who was it dying on the cross? Jesus. Well, it was God. <laughs> the Hebrew scriptures tell us that. I mean, just, there's, there's, there's places where it's over, you know, overtly evident. Like um, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, that he will be called wonderful. Counselor. Right? What's the next word? Mighty. Mighty God. Mighty God. Right? That, that, that the Messiah would be the mighty God. And uh, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, right, that he, he will come, right, and be born in Bethlehem. The ruler, the Messiah, will come and be born in Bethlehem. Who's um, of ancient times, like the word in, in the Hebrew, before time began, he was. And that is, again, that's, that is a reference to the Messiah being God. Jesus, he stood before the, the Pharisees and he said, before Abraham was, what, I am. I am. I am. And he appears in the, in the book of the Revelation to John, but he's the Alpha and the Omega, right? He's the Aleph and, and he is the Tau. In Numbers, you know in Numbers, we, we, something I've taught is I've got taught in the Gospels here on Sunday, when Jesus, uh, he was talking to the, the Pharisees about their tassels. Remember, they would, they would make very long tassels. And God instructed the, the, the Jews, make tassels, and they were to be a reminder of him. But what happened was in their religious religiosity, right, the one with the longest tassels, they were the most spiritual. So they, instead of just making tassels, they, they became prideful and they made tassels. They, they would be extravagant in their tassels. So that, that comes from Numbers chapter 59. Again, look, look at this passage. It's him and you will see a tassel. And to you and uh, be, uh, he will be um, all of, and right there the word appears again. All of, right, what is it saying? The Aleph and the Tal. Um, so you will remember. So you will remember him. The tassels were to be a reminder of, of him, God. The, the Aleph and, and the Tal. So you may obey uh, Yahweh's uh, commands. And um, so when you, you come to Genesis, again, when, when you see this little, this little word there, one of the seven words, it is a, a reference to him being the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Mm -hmm. One little more. <laughs> Amazing what's in one verse, right? There is a, what is called in, in Scripture, this is called an, an equidistant letter sequence. And uh, there are these equidistant letter sequences that, and, and, as, and as the computer ages come, Actually, you can buy your own program. It's about 70 bucks, and you can play with this. Just be careful with it, because there's some kooks out there who are doing some kooky stuff with it. And it's, you know, what, what is there? There is a, a biblical uh, numbering. And, um, we are not numerologists, and that's a cold practice. So you have to be careful when you're, you're messing around with stuff. But an equidistant uh, letter sequence, and, and here would be an equidistant letter sequence. Every fourth letter here, and just the letter rips, explained, that each code is a case uh, of adding every fourth letter uh, to form a word and read the code, okay? Do you, you get that, every fourth letter? I'm just, by the way, this is just made up. So when you, when you come to, to Genesis, again, the, the, the seven sequence, if you, if you get into the first, the first chapter of Genesis, if you take every 49th letter, it spells Torah. And uh, the, Hebrew, the Hebrew spelling, T-O-R-H. There's, there's, no, there's no A there. And uh, if you go to the other books, uh, of the scriptures, so in Genesis, the first uh, there's a 49 a letter sequence of uh, Torah, and in Exodus there is Torah. Torah doesn't appear in Leviticus. In Numbers, it is spelled now backwards the other way. So you have you have instead of again it, it's it's uh, Torah, but um, it begins it would begin with H R O T, and then Deuteronomy same thing. Notice everything is moving, uh, every the Torah, Torah everything focuses. In Leviticus, the, the letter sequence spells Yahweh. Isn't that cool? So the, the sequence looks like, like, like this. In, you're, you're reading Genesis. It's Torah, Torah, Yahweh, Torah, Torah. Everything is coming back to Yahweh. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Wow. In um, Proverbs 25, what's happening? I'm going too fast? <laughs> It's just, you know what, you know what, this is, if you don't get all of this, okay, what you should get, 
is that when you're reading the Word, you're, you're reading the revelation of God. Nothing like it. It's not the sports page. It, it, it's not the daily news. You're reading the revelation. This is, I mean, and, 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 and he, and he it, it's this integrated, um, majestic message system. And it's living, and it's alive. And when you open your heart to it, he speaks directly to you as his child. And uh, reveals these wonders to you. In Proverbs 25, 2, it says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings it is to search out a matter. How many of you realize that God calls you kings? Where does God call us kings? We know he calls us priests and ministers and ambassadors and children and the light of the world and the salt of the earth and the redeemed and saints, holy ones, sanctified. Where does he call us kings? Anybody? Revelation. Nobody knows. I, mean, I, would, I would think that would be a pretty, a pretty important passage to, uh, as far as our identity goes, to, um, to learn. It says, and, uh, and has made us, this is Revelation chapter 1 verse 6, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. How many of you have ever seen the Narnia Chronicles? Have you seen Narnia Chronicles? Read the Narnia Chronicles? Right, the four kids, right? They went through the wardrobe and they enter into the, the land of Narnia. And uh, after the great battle and they, they defeat the, um, the white witch, and it was the devil, and Aslan dies for them right on the sacred rock, a picture of Jesus dying on the cross. And they appear before Aslan in the great kingdom what happens to those kids? What are they made? They're made kings. He says, "You will rule with me. You will sit on. You, you will sit on my throne and judge the nations." And I just think here is like we need to understand our role as, as the people of God. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search out a matter. What a joy it is! Let me tell you something: to dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And how you know it's like I find the Word of God. It's like it's like it's like digging down. You keep digging and discovering new things, new things, new things. And one little verse, and there's 32,000 more. Fantastic thing. So here, here's our, here's our wrap-up. Um, just to uh, show you something, and just something that, that fascinates me. Right In the beginning, right, God created the heaven of the heavens uh, and the earth. And what you see here is, again, yeah, we get a picture of a, a God who is in, incredibly awesome. Incredibly awesome. And the same God, you just realize, the same God who created the universe. I, I was sitting to my wife the other day. We don't look up. Take time to look up. I, I, I can sit in my pool on my uh, on my raft and I look up. I love to look up and then see the you know see the clouds. And I do. I spend a lot of time looking up. Sit outside and just look up at the stars. And I know they're not always the best. You know, New York's not the best place to look up at the stars. You can get out of this area and then you know you can reach up. You feel like you can even touch them. But just take time to, you know, take time to look up at the God who created, and this is the God who created all of this. And you see some of these, these pictures here. I'll just show you these real quick. Isn't that incredible? Like the butterfly galaxy. Did you ever see the eye galaxy? The, isn't that awesome? God's an artist. These are, these are you know, billions of miles stretched across the, uh, you know, the universe. Here's another one of the, of the eye. But the same, the same God that created this, this universe, again, with his great power and uh, with um, his great wisdom and intelligence, and all these intricate systems, and, and understanding that from, from the micro of an atom to you know, the vast universe and how this whole thing connects, is the same God who gave us his revelation in his word. And it's here, like, we can know of his, we can know of his power by, um, by looking at the universe. We can know of his intelligence by, by studying the systems of the universe, but we come to know him and his heart by reading the Word of God. How fantastic is that? And, um, how many people, right, the sad thing, there's bottles in every home in this country, and there's churches on every corner. How many people, how many people do you know who have come to be able to know, who really know him? And uh, count it a privilege. Count it a privilege that you're here tonight. 
and you're, you're in that place, don't ever take, you know, take it for granted. There's something very mysterious about this whole thing. I think he wants everyone to be saved. I think he wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of his son. He wants everyone in heaven. But there's a mystery here as to why so many are not. And through the ages, we, we just kind of take for granted that why, you know, why we're here tonight. And, uh, we've been given just, right, this is a, a little Greek book, right? A Greek book. Mm -hmm. the greatest book in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the revelation of, of, of Almighty God. Yeah. So we're going to talk to him tonight, right? And he wants to hear our prayers. He wants us to covenant with him in our prayers. So Father in heaven, thank you, Lord God, so much for your word, Lord God. It is a light unto my feet. And it is living, Lord God, and Lord, it is living inside of me, and Lord, it is the living word for you are the living word. In it, through it, we experience you and we know you. We come to understand who you are. We come to understand who we are. We come to understand, Lord God, your great love for us and all that you did for us. And we come to, Lord, understand these great mysteries. And you call us friends. And you share these very deep things, Lord God, with your friends. And they encourage us. They build our faith up, Lord God. They make us stronger. And we thank you for that. So Father, tonight as we come, we come to you, hear our prayers, Lord God. We have things on our hearts, things, Lord God, that we're concerned about. We want to bring them to you and just lift them up to you. And Father God, I know that you'll be listening and you'll be with us tonight. And Lord God, that you will act on these things for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's break up into